Now I'd like to describe projectile motion. So a projectile is an object that's just flying through space under the influence of gravity. We're going to be allowing only one force to act on the object, and that force is gravity. So gravity will be the net force. Projectile problems are popular problems in physics classes for several reasons. One is that projectile motion, as described, is mathematically tractable. We can model it with fairly simple math. It's realistic. It gives us a model and a prediction of motion that you're familiar with and that you can verify from your own experience is realistic. And it teaches us about how velocity vectors work. We get to consider how position and velocity change through time in more than one dimension. Specifically, we're going to talk about work in two dimensions. We're going to describe one dimension that's vertical and one dimension that's horizontal. Conventionally, the vertical dimension is y, and the horizontal dimension is x. In terms of physics, the point of this is that we understand how objects behave when they are thrown, which is a kind of motion that we're quite familiar with and that we see fairly frequently. We call free fall a situation in which an object is under the influence of gravity alone. In this case, the net force is gravity, which acts straight down, so therefore the acceleration is also going to be straight down. The magnitude will be g, which on Earth is 9.8 meters per second per second. There's no acceleration in the horizontal direction because gravity only works down. Gravity does not have a component in the horizontal direction. One really neat thing about projectile motion is that we can treat the horizontal and vertical directions, the x and y, completely independently. They develop independently of each other and they are dependent on time. So let's look at how this works. I'm going to step you through conceptually the progress of a trajectory. So at any one particular time, its position r is going to be described by the previous position, so that's at interval n minus 1, plus the change in position, and the change in position is the average velocity times the time. The position at the end of the previous interval plus the average velocity over this interval times the time interval gives you the new position at the end of this interval. What's the average velocity during this interval? Well, it's going to be equal to what the average velocity of the previous interval was, plus the acceleration times time. The acceleration is constant. So let's trace out how this works. At the beginning of some interval, the projectile is here. Over the interval, it travels a distance delta r1 to move to this new position. So this delta r is going to be the average velocity over that interval times the time. Over the next interval, the average velocity will be a little bit different. So we can start by saying what the average velocity was over the previous interval. Then we have to add to it the acceleration times the time. The acceleration is due to gravity. It's straight down. So we have a change that's straight down. The position of the projectile at the end of the second interval will be a little bit lower than the change at the end of the previous interval. And so this is our new position change over interval Two. Then to look at interval 3, well, we take our position change from interval 2, add in the effect of acceleration. That tells us where the projectile is at the end of interval 2, and this shows the change in position. For the interval after that, well, we take the previous change in position, add to it the effect of gravity. That tells us the position at the end of this next interval, and there is the change in position vector. The next interval, interval 4, we take the previous change in position vector, add the influence of gravity to get the position at the end of this interval. There's the new change in position vector. Then for the next interval, take the previous change in position vector, add to it the effect of gravity. There's our new change in position vector. I hope that made sense qualitatively. You may wish to play this back, stopping frequently. In terms of the math modeling this process, this is what we have. It's just a constant acceleration problem, because that's what this is. There's a constant force, therefore a constant acceleration. The only difference is that we have to take into account the vector nature of position, velocity, and acceleration. The projectile and its trajectory are not confined to a single line on a single axis. In terms of vectors, the equation is entirely what we're familiar with the velocity at any time is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. The position at any time is equal to the initial position 
plus the initial velocity times time, plus one half the acceleration times the square of the time. The fun comes because these velocity, acceleration, and position variables are all vectors. So in the case of a two-dimensional situation where we have vertical and horizontal components, all of these vectors have two numbers associated with them. They're vertical and horizontal components. Here I'm going to adopt temporarily the convention that up is positive. There's no physical reason that you have to do this. You can say that up is any direction you want. Just so that we can describe the math right now, I'm going to make the arbitrary decision that up is positive. So the acceleration is a vector with x and y components. We call x is horizontal and y is vertical. The x component is zero. There is no acceleration in the x direction because there is no component of the force in the x direction. The y component of acceleration is going to be negative g. Why negative? Because up is positive and gravity is pulling down. So that would be the negative direction, which gives a negative acceleration. Velocity then also has x and y components. The initial velocity just has initial x and y components. And those can be whatever it is. Your trajectory can start with the object having any initial velocity you want. It can be moving upward, it can be moving downward, it could be moving horizontally, it can be moving at some diagonal upward, it can be moving at some diagonal downward, it can be moving backward in the x direction. Whatever direction in the horizontal axis you decide is positive is a completely arbitrary choice. To specify the position at any time, you also have to know what the initial position was in both its x horizontal and y vertical components. How does velocity change over time? Well, for the x component, it's quite simple. In the x direction, a trajectory is constant velocity motion because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction. The x component of velocity always stays at the initial horizontal component of velocity. The vertical component of velocity is what changes because the acceleration is in the vertical direction. With the convention that up equals positive, the vertical component of velocity at any particular time is equal to the initial vertical component of velocity minus the acceleration g times the time that's elapsed. For position in the horizontal x direction, we just have the constant velocity equation. That position equals the initial position plus the initial x velocity, which is the constant x velocity times time. Position in the vertical direction or the vertical component of position is a constant acceleration situation. So here we have the initial vertical component of position plus the initial vertical component of velocity times time plus the contribution of the acceleration due to gravity, which is minus g. So that gives us minus one half gt squared. These are all the equations that you need to fully characterize ballistic motion without air resistance.